Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Barry Erickson and I'm Community Engagement Coordinator at Wheaton Public Library. Tonight, we are delighted to bring you Backyard Birds. We will learn the history of the birds that commonly visit our communities and discover the who, what, where, when, why, and hows surrounding the fascinating world of backyard bird birding. Our presenter tonight is Nate Hamble. He is a wildlife interpreter with Willowbrook Wildlife Center and has been with the DuPage Forest Preserve since 2010. So thank you so much for being with us tonight, Nate. I'll turn the screen over to you. All right, well, thank you, Barry, for having me. Um, good evening, everybody. It's exciting to see, um, well, actually, I don't see anybody, but it's exciting to know that there's a lot of you um, that are out there according to the numbers that I'm looking at right now. Uh, yeah, so tonight, the focus is gonna be on the backyard birds. And uh, when we talk about backyard birds, I'm not talking about just birds that specifically stay in our backyard, but uh, these are the birds that are local to our area. So these are ones that are either here year round, are breeding in this area or are migrating through this area. And we'll, we'll talk about and highlight a few of those different species, some that you're more likely to see in your backyard, um, and then a few others that you may be able to see in your local forest preserves, in your parks, or in, in other areas. Um, that all being said, uh, we do have a, a large variety of, of species that are present in this area, that come through this area. Uh, working at the Wildlife Center, I've been lucky enough to be able to, well, lucky and unlucky, because the animals that come to us are unfortunately uh, either, either injured or sick or, or orphaned, um, but uh, I am able to see quite a variety of different species. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with the Willowbrook Wildlife Center, uh, we are a wildlife rehab center that is located in Glen Ellen, Illinois. Uh, we have been there since 1957. It was one of the first life estates that was donated to DuPage County Forest Preserve and it's about 50 acres. Um, there's a portion in the back that is just a, a savanna ecosystem with a little um, half mile trail that you can walk around. We have uh, our animal ambassador trail or what they call the exhibit trail where we have some animals that live with us permanently. And then the rest of the place um, focuses on wildlife rehabilitation. Um, and so these are the animals that are are either sick, injured, or orphaned, and we rely on our community members to go ahead and bring those animals to, to us. Uh, so a, a lot of the times, most of the times, the animals that we are, um, that are our patients are generally injured because of some type of human conflict. And we'll kind of discuss a little bit about that today uh, with some of the injuries and some of the, the causes of injury for some of our backyard birds. Uh, but generally, you could probably come up with quite a few reasons as to why animals come and see us. Um, they're either fly into windows, um, are attacked by dogs and cats, hit by vehicles, caught up in litter, sad stories, um, unfortunately. But if things go the way that we want them to, uh, then we're able to hopefully assess the injuries, um, fix them up, and then release them back out into um, the natural environment. And so you may hear me refer to our backyard birds as our friends or our neighbors, um, because I do believe, um, I, I do feel that way, that these truly are our neighbors. These are the animals um, that we share our, our neighborhoods with. And so um, that term does pop out every once in a while for me. Um, and so uh, we are available to be seen at, with, um, by the public. Um, our outdoor facility is available. It's, we're open from 10 to 3 for visitation. And then, of course, uh, we are open from 9 to 5 if you have to bring, if you have any animals that need to be brought in. Um, and then feel free to call as well. And I can answer any more of those questions about the facility um, at the end of this program. But right now, I'd like to focus on our backyard birds. And I want to start it off with a quote um, that some of you may or may not have heard from a, a woman uh, who is quite popular or and made quite a difference in the, in the world of conservation. And the quote goes, those who contemplate the beauty of the earth find reserves of strength that will endure as long as life lasts. There is something infinitely healing in the repeated refrains of nature, the assurance that dawn comes after night and spring after winter. And this was a quote from Rachel Carson, who is, a, um, as the slide states, a catalyst for the modern environmental movement um, and the author of Silent Spring, which is a big deal. And uh, we will talk a little bit about the influence of Silent Springs a little bit later. But basically, she drew attention to, um, uh, to DDT, to an unfortunate um, 
um, chemicals that were being used, um, pesticides that were being used, and the impact that that had on quite a few different species of, of birds. And so I like to bring that quote up there because I do really believe that um, what she says is, is very true. And I think it's super important that we are able to find a connection uh, with the natural environment for ourselves, whatever that might be. And in the case of, uh, of myself and a lot of others that um, I around and that I work with, um, birding and birds are a great way for us to really be able to connect with the natural environment. And so that quite, there's quite a few reasons as to why um, birds are, are a great way to connect with nature. Um, for one, there's many different species of them and they're diurnal species. You know, a lot of people are interested um, in mammals. And when you talk a lot about mammals, we talk a lot of times about the larger uh, megafauna or the larger fauna because they're more visible. We can see them more often. Um, you hear a lot of people talking about exotic mammals. Um, but we don't have a lot of real large exotic animals that are living around here. You know, obviously the largest one is gonna be the white-tailed deer. Um, but we don't get a, an opportunity to see mammals like we have the opportunity to see birds um, for a couple of reasons. For one, um, the, the variety of species, um, but also because a lot of mammals are nocturnal as opposed to birds where there's quite a few that are diurnal. And so that just, they, they share the same daylight with us. They share the same time. Um, there are over 10,000 species of birds. Um, and that, that are throughout the world and quite a few of them obviously are on this continent. And they are on every continent of the world as well. Um, and of course, they have beautiful colors and patterns, and and they uh, they have great, just gorgeous displays. And that all depends on you know obviously the species and where they're at. But even the ones that we have in our own yards um, come in quite a variety of sizes and shapes. And so it's just really fascinating to be able to see um, all these all these differences. Uh, biological differences so close to home. And then, of course, it's super cool to think about the fact that birds can fly and they can fly very long distances, you know, from, from the tips of Argentina to the tops of Alaska. And, uh, and that's just amazing to be able to think that an animal can endure uh, such a long, dangerous, and, um, and quite time consuming and, and energy expensive journey to be able to survive. And, and, and the reason why they're doing this is, is fascinating as well. So that's why I think birds kind of have been a, a, a means for us to be able to connect with the natural world is because um, they're accessible. And so they allow us um, access and they are accessible for all types uh, of people and, and individuals to be able to um, connect with the natural world. And so that's what I want to talk about is, is some of these animals that we have here. So there's a few things that we that you can learn about when when looking into bird identification and some of the basics that go along with it. And of course, size is a big component. Shape. Uh, so when I'm talking about shape, is I'm talking about their beak shapes a lot of times. Um, you know, their silhouette shapes, as you can see in this picture. Um, it's some type of shorebird, most likely a, a, an egret or a heron of sorts. Uh, so there's you can tell a lot just by their size and their shape, even if you had very little else to work with. Um, behavior is a really big aspect of it as well. And I like to really focus on that. I know there's some some folks that really like to find different species and that's fantastic. And you get whatever it takes to get out there and connect. But I think it's really cool to be able to spend a little bit of time and watch the behaviors of some of the birds that we see most frequently. Um, habitat is another way that we can identify birds. You know, there's definitely, we're not going to find any penguins walking around in our prairies. Um, so those are, it's obviously an extreme example, but the, the concept is there is that you can tell certain woodland species compared to prairie species, compared to wetland species. And so understanding what habitats birds prefer is also really helpful um, in identifying them. And then color patterns. Uh, they always talk about when you when you're identifying waterfowl, look where the white is, because um, they may have different patches of white in different areas, and so color patterns are really important as well. And then the field markings are going to be more of the intricate designs, the, the complex complex facial um, lines and designs that we can see, and and that's one way that we can help to identify some of those species that, um, to the untrained eye, may look very similar, but as you look a little bit more closely and with a little bit more detail, uh, you'll be able to see some of the, the, the finite points that make them different. And then, of course, there's calls as well in their songs, and that's another way to be able to identify them, um, is by able to 
what are they saying to us or to each other, I should say, not to us. Well, sometimes it is to us, but um, usually those are alert calls and ones that are not very inviting, but they do talk to us um, or at least to each other about us. Let's put it that way. So those are some of the basics to uh, some bird um, identification. I want to talk about a couple of species that I have highlighted here and some that people are very familiar with, um, but may not, under, may not know. Um, the, the rock pigeon, or what some people just refer to as the pigeon, um, is not native to this area. And so uh, I like to bring this up because um, as a representative with the Willowbrook Wildlife Center, uh, we are limited on our resources. We're limited on our space. We're limited on our, on our staff, our volunteers. Um, and quite honestly, our time as well. And so we have to put limitations as to what types of animals um, and how many patients we can take in. And so to align with the mission of the forest preserve, uh, we focus on the, the native um, fauna, and in this case, the, the native birds. Um, and unfortunately, rock pigeons, as beautiful as they are in so many different colors, and whatever your opinion might be of rock pigeons, um, they have found a way to be successful in an environment that has been significantly altered by human activity. And so we can't fault them for that. Unfortunately, Willowbrook doesn't have the resources to take them on. That being said, um, we do try and find other places where you can go if you do find a sick, injured, or orphaned um, rock pigeon. Um, but yes, yeah, as you can see with this map that was provided by Cornell Lab of Ornithology, um, they are, they have expanded all over the United States into Mexico and into Canada as well. Um, and they're a very successful um, species and we've all most likely seen them in the Chicagoland region. Um, but again, these are non-native species. On that same note, uh, another very common species is the house sparrow. Um, another um, Non-native, um, beautiful colors, beautiful field markings, the males in particular, the females are a little bit more drab in color, uh, which is quite often the case when it comes to songbirds and a lot of other species is they have what we call a um, sexual dimorphism, which is basically meaning that there's two different appearances based on the, the sex of the animals. Um, and if you want to be even more scientifically nerdy about it, uh, we can call it sex. Um, dichromatic sexual dimorphism. Um, so uh, you'll see that more apparent again with uh, waterfowl or a good example is the cardinals. People see that quite often. Uh, in the case of house sparrows, it is the, the same for males. And so this photo that I have here is of a male um, house sparrow. But again, unfortunately, it is um, non-native. Uh, to this area, and it has been very successful. They tend to nest in, in our cavities, um, around our homes. Um, so if you want to try to help alleviate some of that, you can put up different cavities, um, different bird nests, bird houses. Um, and even though you may want to encourage native species to be there, um, it still allows a place for these non-natives to go as opposed to being you know, um, in our gutter systems and stuff like that. Um, so again, you can kind of see they're year round, um, in this area, um, and they are all over the place. Um, and a lot of that has to do with the fact that they're adaptable uh, and they also, they breed uh, quite often as well. And they're one of the earlier um, breeders and nesters in the area. And then the, the last non-native that we're gonna talk about that again, unfortunately Willowbrook cannot take in is the European starling. And I really like this bird because it's, I think it's underappreciated, but it's a beautiful bird. Um, you can really see that, that iridescent color um, in that black. And what's really cool about it is they actually have different plumages depending on the time of year. Um, so this is a winter plumage, whereas this is going to be more spring and summer plumage. And of course, as the case is for most birds, um, the, the spring plumage is going to be their brightest, most beautiful, vibrant color. And that has everything to do with attracting a mate and um, for breeding season. Um, uh, so one of the things that's fascinating about the European starling uh, besides the fact that they've, again, just like the rock pigeon and the house sparrow have been super successful in this area, um, is the fact that they have those two different plumages. And what happens is, is these little white spots, these little white speckles that you can see on them, uh, they stay on them um, and they're still a part of the same feathers, except for the fact that 
um, as time goes on, they start to wear off. And so it quite literally is the edges of these little feathers that are wearing down to where it starts to get rid of some of that, that white color. And you can still see the iridescent illuminate, illuminating colors that are, um, that are part of their plumage. But again, you can also see the beak color can change. Um, and so again, that's not uncommon for birds. It's one of the most, it's one of the fascinating things about them is their ability to, to kind of morph into different colors depending on uh, what the season is. And again, that has a lot to do with uh, caloric intake and energy output. It takes a lot of energy to be able to look good. Um, and so the, uh, these birds, uh, they want to, it's kind of, I like to equate it, you know, it's in springtime, they're going out on a first date, they're making themselves look all nice and prim and proper and all beautiful. And then, you know, after breeding season comes, they've been around for a little bit of time, they kind of let things go here and there. Yeah, they might, you know, go, you know, come next spring, they might spruce themselves up again, but they might give them a little bit, a little bit of downtime and just kind of um, let the let the feathers just kind of become a little bit more dull. And that's, again, it's really all about being energy efficient. It costs a lot of energy to be um, bright and beautiful. Um, so that with the, the, the European starling, gorgeous birds, um, they tend to flock together. Um, you, they're known for their murmurations. If you're unfamiliar with that word, what we're talking about is those, those beautiful, they almost look like um, you know, fish in the sea as they move from one area to the next area and they do it in unison. Um, gorgeous animals, you can see them in really big numbers um, out in Europe. And you can still see them in, in murmuration or doing murmurations out in agricultural fields as well. So again, non-native, but still um, an interesting and intriguing species to, to observe. And then, of course, we've got our common animals that most of us are quite familiar with. And so uh, most of you have probably seen or heard um, American robins. They are native to this area, and they are successful in this area. Um, they spend their time here year round, um, and they do that by adapting uh, their their diets. So during the you know the warmer months, they're going to be more insectivorous. They're going to be eating um, also worms and other um, and other types of insects. But then come winter time, they'll adjust their diet to where they're going to be eating more berries, um, and they're going to be getting some of those later berries and some other seeds as well. Um, some facts that some folks are unfamiliar with uh, with American robins is they're actually part of the thrush family. So if you're familiar with hermit thrush or Swainson's thrushes. Um, um, they are they are similar, and so one of those things that I was talking about in the beginning when learning how to identify animals is you can tell a lot um, by the shape and the shape of their beak, and they have that very distinct thrush-like beak um, in a line with that um, thrush size that they have. So they're bigger birds, um, big, bright, um, robust chests that are nice and orange and red in color. Um, and you'll see them, sometimes people may be like, I think that's a robin, I'm not really sure. Um, but when they're younger animals, when they're uh, when they're just you know born this year, um, they fledged out of their nest, they may not have this bright, beautiful red, they're gonna have speckled chests. Um, and that's because they haven't gotten their adult plumage. And, we'll, and you'll see some more examples of that as we continue on with this. All right, a common grackle sometimes can get mistaken for that European starling, uh, but not common grackles are native to this area. And you can see that they mostly reside more toward the east and toward the mountainous areas um, where they'll do some breeding. Gorgeous animals, they do tend to become gregarious during uh, times of movement. So if they're migrating from place to place, um, they may move in, in groups, but oftentimes you'll see them more solitary um, when, you're, when you're looking for them um, outside of, of transitional seasons. They're known for that very beautiful iridescent color. Um, you can really see that in, in the right light, very beautiful birds. Larger birds, long tails. Um, again, they're very, they are common to this area, but they can be easily mistaken for starlings. The big difference that you'll notice with them is the starlings come breeding season in summer. Uh, they don't have, um, starlings have yellow beaks, whereas um, grackles do not. There's interesting bird species. We have one that lives with us at the Wildlife Center that was raised in captivity. Now, granted, it's protected by the International Migratory Bird Act, and so that is illegal to do. Um, but the one that was raised in captivity, somehow 
um, whomever it was that was, they were with must have had a horrific cough or a wheeze to them. He tends to mimic the sound. If one of us goes <coughs> and coughs, um, he will sometimes uh, repeat that cough back to us. And then he does like a wheeze afterward, which is kind of funny um, to hear. He does sometimes, uh, right now, unfortunately, he's indoors um, to protect him against some of the West Nile that's, that could be present. Um, him and his, his roommate is just a blue jay. Um, but our grackle, his name is Zach, um, will be going back outside hopefully at some point during this season um, or in the near future and you folks will have an opportunity to be able to meet him um, he's an interesting interesting character he's pretty cool to to be able to hang around with um, like most of the animals that live with us permanently they are on medications uh, because they are geriatric animals they have some type of permanent disability or, or, or injury um, we're able to administer his medication by putting it on um, little larvae, um, waxworms is what they are, and we can throw it up in the air and he'll catch them, which is kind of cool to be able to watch. So he's an interesting little guy. So I suppose I might be a little bit biased. Um, he's tended to make me a little bit more um, interested and fascinated by grackle species because of the one individual. But you know what? Sometimes that's all that it takes to build that connection. So brown-headed cowbirds, here's a, a species that could be controversial to some folks. Um, my idea is, is that these are all animals. They all have a right to live. They've all learned how to live. Um, even if we don't accept their ways of living um, in, in some ways, they still have earned it. And so for those of you that are unfamiliar um, with the brown-headed cowbird, they are what we call a brood parasite um, bird. What that means is that they will lay their eggs in a host nest um, and allow for or the other, another species uh, per parents to care for their young. And the reason that they do this is because uh, historically they would travel with the migrating bison. And they don't really have um, that luxury to travel with the migrating bison anymore uh, around this area. Uh, but they still um, adhere to their, you know, their natural means of reproducing. And when you travel with um, a migratory large mammal like that, you don't have the time to provide that parental care that so many other bird species do. And so um, in order to get your, your genetics passed on from generation to generation, they had to adapt and figure out a different way. And the way that they did was by laying their eggs it's actually quite interesting. The females, um, which look much more drab than this, they don't have these beautiful um, bright brown heads and, and dark bodies. They're a little bit more just kind of like a grayish brown all the way across. Um, but the females will kind of become go into sleuth mode and they will, um, you can see them kind of stalking out some of the different nests uh, that, that might be in the area. They get down low in some of the shrubs and then they might pop up and try and sneak into a cardinal nest or another nest um, and lay one of their eggs. And it's interesting to see um, when you see a, a cardinal egg compared to a cowbird egg or a robin egg, um, you can really sometimes tell the differences between them. They're much larger in size, speckled. Um, a lot of the times they tend to put them in smaller bird's nests. Now, that being said, birds, other species have learned to adapt and have also put up some defenses, which is interesting. A lot of them um, can notice the difference and they'll kick out the egg before it has time to incubate um, and before the, the offspring are able to hatch. Um, other times, um, another bird, the yellow warbler, which is interesting, will actually build a second layer of its nest on top of um, the, 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 where the cowbird laid its egg um, and hopefully preventing it from being able to properly incubate um, is the only incubating its own eggs when um, it's time for them to hatch. But it's quite interesting when you see this massive little um, hatchling um, compared to this tiny little songbird um, still begging for mother to give food. Uh, there, if you have an opportunity, you can see some interesting um, videos or photos of that stuff online. Um, you know, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a great resource for anything about birds. Um, and that's where you can find a lot of these resources and they've allowed us to use their mappings, their map, their drawn maps to show some of their territories. But again, cowbirds get a bad reputation um, because of their, the, the way that they try to survive. But again, it's, they've had to do this for, you know, for as long as they've been around um, and they continue to have to do this, even though we've again altered the, the, the environment for them. So here we have our Eastern Bluebird. Eastern Bluebirds are beautiful birds. You're gonna see a lot of bluebird nests um, out and about in DuPage County in our forest preserves. You may even see them um, in the Morton Arboretum if you visit that area. Um, they're usually just on a metal pole. So if you're wondering what are these, these 
the nest boxes that are that are out in these fields. A lot of the time, they're eastern bluebird um, nest boxes. Uh, their population isn't necessarily hor horrendous, um, but there there has been um, quite a bit of habitat loss because they do like open fields um, for the most part or savanna areas. Uh, so there has been. Um, quite a bit of habitat loss for them. So this was an attempt to try and alleviate some of those pressures by providing them with some different cavities where they could go ahead and nest. Uh, obviously, they need to have some type of tree cover or something um, in order to be able to nest in some of those those cavities traditionally or historically, um, this is another means for them to be able to do that. The problem is, is that a lot of other birds are cavity nesters, such as the house sparrow, um, but also the um, tree swallows are another one. They tend to arrive earlier than the eastern bluebirds um, during migration. And when they do this, uh, you know, they tend to take over those nesting areas. And so the bluebirds don't always get them. But again, you will find uh, in a number of places, the, the arboretums does a great job with, with some of their, their nest boxes. Um, and you can actually see some of the, the bluebirds, the males, females, and the young of year, uh, or that year's young, uh, at, those, at those cavities. So bluebirds are beautiful uh, species to be able to see. Um, there are a number of different types of bluebird species. Um, in this area, this is the only one that we would be able to spot. And you can identify them with this beautiful bright orange chest and, of course, this blue coloration in them. And blue, in, in general, is a very fascinating color in the natural world because it's not so much about the pigmentation. Um, it's more about the way that the light refracts in their, in their feathers. And so like indigo buntings and blue jays um, are a great example too. If you ever see one of their feathers, um, depending on how you hold it up to the light, um, the color can become more can become darker and it doesn't show that blue pigment um, that you would see in other colors like reds and yellows and such. All right, so here's a one that's very familiar with people um, is the red winged blackbird. Blackbird, it's one of the first that you're going to see come springtime. They are, they love to get up here nice and early. You're going to see them, of course, this is on some cat, some cattails. Uh, you're going to see them singing along. I do have a little recording if you are familiar um, with the bird that is making the sound during early spring, and I will let you hear that. So that is the red-winged blackbird. And you can identify, of course, by that call, but you can also identify them by this red epaulette that's on their, um, on their, on their wings. Um, sometimes you will see that, that it's not super bright red. It's more of a yellow in color. Um, and that can have, uh, it, it can deal with their genetics, how successfully they are able to breed, how healthy they might be doing, um, or how healthy they might be. Um, but um, for the most part, it's going to be a shade of red or oranges with some yellow that's underneath um, as well. But uh, you'll be able to see some type of coloration in this epaulette on, on the red winged blackbirds. And again, they're really early migrators, uh, migrants. Um, so you'll see them come, you know, first signs of spring. And as you can see with this map, they're all over the place. So you'll find them in a lot of different locations, um, no matter where you go in the US. Um, and then of course in Canada as well. But they, they do rely on, um, they do rely on, you know, hanging around wetland areas or at least wetland edges for the most part. Um, and so and locally, um, they tend to, for the most part, they're going to um, migrate a little bit locally they'll migrate farther down south. Despite the fact that this map does say that this is year-round area, they can survive here, they can live here year-round, but what you'll find is most of the population will leave um, this area. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about some of those bird feeder species. The ones that we were just discussing are ones that you can see in your forest preserves, um, in your park systems, but then there's a few that are a little bit more specific um, to some of your feeders. Um, and so what we got, we've got, I believe, a chipping sparrow on our right side. We've got, this is obviously is still a species you can find at your bird feeder, which many of us do. Um, and then we have a yellow rump warbler over to our left as well. Um, and these these guys can come to your feeders. Um, they are, depending on what kind of area you have surrounding you, what type of trees you have, um, how much space you have, will kind of depend on which species are going to be your bird feeder species. But what we'll discuss here, I'll share with you, is some of the more common ones that you're going to see around here. 
Um, of course, uh, the Northern Cardinal is one that comes around. And so bright, beautiful. This is one of those that I was talking has that sexual dimorphism, the dichromatic sexual dimorphism, um, where the females are going to be more brown in color, but they still do have hints of red. Um, they'll still have um, a, a colored beak, not quite as bright red as, as the males are, uh, but they still have some like, browns and reds that kind of mixed nicely together. I still think that the females are a very beautiful species. Uh, but what you can see here is the Northern Cardinal spends most of its time, or, or I should say all of its time, in, in the eastern section of the United States. It doesn't far go past the, the Rocky Mountains. Um, and so it's pretty unique for us to be able to see this if you were living out in, you know, in the Northwest or out in California, this spe species, even though it's very common here, would not be very common in that area. Um, and so that's something to take into consideration uh, is that a lot of times animals that we see often we can take for granted. But that's what I was talking about with watching behaviors is that it's still interesting to watch um, the males and females court with one another. Um, you can sometimes even find their nests if you look carefully enough they're not they don't tend to nest high up in the trees they tend to nest in lower areas in the shrubs of course disclaimer is this please do not disturb any of those nests um, or any of the young that are in them uh, but they are generally uh, relatively low lying nests when you see them and they have a beautiful sound and you can hear this sound all throughout the year um, some of them are more common calls that you might hear during different times of the year, but this one um, is pretty common that you're going to be able to see. And they look just beautiful um, during the winter time when you have a, a nice white backdrop of snow and, and there's no um, foliage that's blocking your view. That last little part was a trill. It's not super common to hear it always doing that trill, but those first few few notes were definitely very common. They kind of sound like lasers to me. So uh, I think it's really a beautiful sound that cardinals are able to give to us. Oops. Uh, the American goldfinch. So I'm sure if you are, if any of you are birders or backyard birders or sitting out watching your feeders, um, there's a good chance that you've probably seen some active goldfinch. American goldfinch are, um, they breed later in the season. Right now at Willowbrook, we have um, quite a few, I want to say 25-ish um, baby goldfinches that we're taking care of right now. Um, it is breeding season. They rely heavily on seed. Um, that's the shape of their beak. They are seed eaters. If you look at that kind of beak, um, more triangular shape, similar to the cardinal, um, meant to crush um, seeds and nuts. Uh, they like to eat uh, the seeds that are, are more available, more accessible, uh, like thistle, for example, this time of year. And so that gives them a little bit of a competitive advantage that they're not feeding and breeding at the same time as a lot of the other um, songbirds of this area. If they wait a little bit longer to start breeding, um, then they're able to have more food resources so that they can provide their young with that type of stuff. The disadvantage to that is, is that you are bringing young out into the world with a shorter season. And so you have to hope that these youngsters can get um, able, are able to fly, um, able to feed themselves before the first frosts and, and winter season starts to come. And so you can kind of see um, their breeding. It can go up north, but you'll see that they'll, they will, um, they'll come a little bit farther south um, during uh, migration season. And of course, they are around here um, year round if we have milder winters, but that doesn't mean individuals aren't still moving down, aren't still moving down south. Um, but what you will notice is that the bright yellow color um, is not going to be quite as vibrant um, for the males. And so uh, during the winter season than it is during their breeding season. So right now we see those real bright, beautiful colors uh, on males. Females are going to be similar patterns, but more drab. Um, in color, but come winter time or late fall, uh, actually even late summer, their colors are going to start to fade. They're not going to be bright yellow and as beautiful. And some of that has to do with the fact that these colors, the yellows and the blacks, are really high energy colors. They require a lot of food um, and resources, calories in order to maintain those colors in their feathers. Um, but the American goldfinches, they are a little bit more gregarious than some of the other species, uh, meaning they tend to be in larger groups with one another, um, similar to like what a cedar waxwing, they also are, they tend to group together a little bit more. Um, 
So you'll usually see, you might see one or two at a time, but you may also see them in quite a few. Um, you may have seen them at your bird feeders. There are specific goldfinch bird feeders where you put thistle in them um, and you can get them to collect in, in relatively large numbers um, around those types of feeders if you want to see them. But of course, uh, one of the issues that we find with uh, finches in general, house finches and gold finches, is that the way those feeders are set up, um, you the the birds have to press their the side of their face up to to get to the to the food, and what that can do is it. It can create a situation where diseases can spread more easily if that feeder isn't well maintained because they're rubbing their eye up against it to get food and then the next bird comes in and rubs its eye up against it and so what we find is that um, um, conjunctivitis is one of the diseases that's more easily spread amongst finches um, gold and house finches um, and then there are other diseases as well, such as salmonella. It just tends to be more easily spread through that tube feeding system, which is what they prefer. Um, but the issue is, is the way that they have to feed and get to that seed. So let's hear the sound of a American goldfinch. Again, a very beautiful sound. You can hear them. They also will sing in flight. They have a little bit of a, uh, their, their, their song when they're perched compared to their song when they fly is a little bit different, but you can identify them um, when they're in flight. For one, if they are singing, they're not always singing, but by their flight patterns, they tend to drop and dip like this quite a bit when they're flying. And so if you see a bird doing that, there's a good chance that it's a goldfinch, especially this time of year. All right, house finches, I'll just touch briefly on these. Um, these are also in the area we do um, help out with the house finches, but they're considered to be naturalized. So they're not technically um, native to this area, but what they find is that they're not, they aren't competing with food resources, competing with breeding grounds um, in the same way that starlings and house sparrows are. Their numbers aren't multiplying so much to where they were considered to be invasive species. And so um, they've been considered here long enough to where they are naturalized. Um, you can kind of see that there are little pockets um, where they, are, they aren't really uh, hanging out more toward the Great Plains areas, um, but they are on the east and they are on the west coast. And so another common bird that you can find is going to be the house finch. Uh, identifiable with the males by this red color. Um, females are a little bit more drab, but you find that streaky color on their chest. Um, and then that finch beak, very um, famous finch beak right there. So here's what they sound like. So again, we never expect everyone to uh, memorize any of these things. And so there are some apps and stuff that can ha help you with that if you're out there taking notes. Um, the Merlin app by, again, Cornell Lab of Ornithology is a really good um, app. They actually just added a new feature that helps identify sound. Morning doves, a uh, common animal that we'll see around here. They are similar. Uh, they are rock pigeons and morning doves are in the same you know, family. They are considered to both be a dove, but the morning dove is native to this area. They're the ones that you hear that morning sound, which is where they get their name. It's not about the time of day. Um, it's more about the, the, the sound, that, the, the essence that they give when they, when they make their call. sad and somber tunes uh, with the morning dove, but um, you'll see them a lot of times around your house. Uh, they tend to build their nests horribly. They are not very good at building nests. They just put a bunch of sticks together and hope that it stays. But what they do is they will build nests in areas that are close to um, human structures. And what that allows them to do is to have access to areas that might be a little bit less inviting to, to natural predators. And so they've kind of utilized um, human resources um, to, to, to build a nest where they can uh, protect their young from, you know, uh, different types of hawk species, Cooper's hawks, uh, sharp shins, that kind of stuff. And so just like in this photo, you'll see them a lot of times on fences, fence posts, gutters. Um, you might even see their nests in there. So if you see a really, it's built usually out of sticks and it looks like this is the, one of the world's worst net, nests that's ever been built, um, there's a good chance that it's a morning dove from around this area. But if you ever get an opportunity to look at them through the, the binoculars, uh, which you should, if you 
um, if you use binoculars, uh, they have these beautiful colors of blues um, that you can see. And they're just, an, again, a beautiful bird if you take the time to, to look at the detail. All right, so ruby-throated hummingbird is another species that a lot of people ask us about, how do I get them into my backyard? Um, well, the thing is, is sugar water. They focus on nectar. Uh, that is what they are doing. They're going from tubular flower to tubular flower. Um, you know, like the trumpet vine is a really good example of a great um, ruby-throated hummingbird um, plant. Um, but, you know, native plants in general are gonna be good for them. Uh, that being said, supplementing those native plants with uh, hummingbird feeders is great. The one thing that we say is please do not use the red dye in those feeders. It is toxic to them. It can kill them. On that same note, if you are going to do um, a ruby-throated hummingbird feeder, um, we ask that you are vigilant in cleaning it um, and making sure that it has um, fresh sugar water in there. Uh, the problem is if you leave it in there too long, it can ferment and that alcohol can start to be, it can be deadly for these guys. Uh, they're a fascinating species, uh, but they are the only hummingbird species that we have on the East Coast on this side of the Mississippi. There's actually over 300 different types of hummingbird species in the, in the, Western, um, in the Western world, including um, North America and South America, but there's only one that lives in this area. Hummingbirds are interesting. They're, they don't exist. They're similar um, in what you, people refer to as the old world, you know, in, in Europe and Africa and Asia. Um, but hummingbirds are only here in the new world, um, North America and South America. But here in, the, in, in Illinois, you're only going to see the ruby-throated. Um, this is a female or a youngster. Um, and this, they believe this is a female. And then this is going to be a um, a male ruby-throated. And the reason I say I believe this is because sometimes youngsters and females can often look alike, but in the case of these other feathered developments, this looks very much so like a female. Uh, but this red color, this gorget as they call it on their necks, um, they, can, they can flash that ruby color or it can look like black, like a black uh, throat. So that's how you can tell if it's male, if it's flashed red or if it's just a black throat. Otherwise it would be kind of a stripy or spotty, um, a, a very plain colored throat. All right, so a few other things to take into consideration when looking for birds and identifying them is their behaviors. And so there's different types of behaviors. You have social behaviors, foraging behaviors, maintenance behaviors. And what I mean by maintenance behaviors is you could talk about um, nest building as maintenance, but what I'm referring to is going to be talking about preening, um, taking care of themselves, those types of maintenance, you know, um, rubbing their beaks or feeking their beaks, that kind of stuff. You also have parental behaviors um, and then anti-predatory behaviors. And I'll briefly go through those real quick uh, just to give you some examples of what I'm talking about. Um, so social behaviors, you know, we're talking about communal living, flocks and rookeries. Um, so they're going to they're going to have different types of um, ways of nonverbal communication, sometimes verbal um, communication with one another. Um, and that could be, you know, juxting for position and that kind of stuff, um, you know, but uh, there are th that is one of the different types of behaviors that you can look into, which can help you to identify a bird is is the gregarious, is it solitary. Um, Allo grooming is another social behavior that is just interesting to watch. Um, sometimes they will, they will groom one another. Uh, they will obviously groom um, themselves, but that's more of a maintenance behavior. So they're gonna, they are, you will see sometimes um, males and females will groom each other. Um, they'll even sometimes feed one another, which is interesting. Um, territory disputes, of course, you'll see that, especially with the larger predators, but you'll see it with other ones as well. Blue jays are a good example of territorial disputes, whether it's within their own species or other species. Um, great horned owls are always, you know, during breeding season are chatting um, with one another to claim their territories, their breeding, te um, their breeding territory. And then courting, of course, you're going to see that as well, you know, different types of, of movements and dances um, in order to find a mate. And so those are all considered to be social behaviors. Foraging behaviors, you can see this is really good to take time if you have an opportunity to look at different types of shorebirds. They show all different types of foraging behaviors, but you can see this even amongst the ones that are in the trees or in the grasses. Um, some animals prefer to forage um, or hunt in the higher canopies. Some prefer to hunt down low um, in the grasses. So it's all this. And then, you know, in the case of some of the plovers, they're going to be, you know, hunting by eyesight, but they're going to be um, looking around the, the mud um, or the sandy areas and the shallows of, of, of lakes and, and, and riverbeds. So foraging behavior, you know, hunting, 
Um, gleaning, what we're talking about with gleaning is where they're taking insects off of leaves or the underside of leaves. Um, food caches, a good example of that is the black capped chickadee. You know, they'll take some seeds and they'll go hide it in different places in different, tree, in different trees to prepare themselves. If there's a food shortage um, coming cold winter, they do stick around here year round. Um, fly catching, um, you'll see that, you know, quite literally with fly catching birds where, uh, or hawking is what you can call it, where they fly out, they grab an insect and they fly back to the same perch or similar perch real close by. Um, and then of course probing is where again you'll see that um, more with shorebirds where they're going to be sticking their beaks um, feeling around in the, in the different types of soils and substrates. And so again those are different types of foraging behaviors. And so the more familiar you are with those um, the better um, the better knowledge you'll have on, on what animal it is. Oops. Uh, maintenance behaviors, talking about bathing, dusting, water. Um, some of them will even go and do anting where they'll let the insects, um, you know, um, release some of their little, uh, their chemicals onto them, which can help protect their feathers. Preening is where they're, you know, they're grooming and pulling their feathers through. Um, rousing is fluffing and stretching. And then of course, scratching, you can see all those behaviors. And then of course, parental behaviors are gonna include building the nest for those that are nest builders or finding a nest. Um, the brooding, feeding your young or defending your young. And so um, these are all different things right here. You can see two osprey um, that are right uh, feeding you can, the young feeding the mother or the <laughs> vice versa, the mother feeding the young in this case. Anti-predatory behaviors, uh, of course, fleeing, hiding. This is a, you'll see mobbing a lot of times. Uh, these are crows that are mobbing a red-tailed hawk here. Uh, so what you'll find is, you know, you, you smaller birds will go after larger birds a lot of times. Most of the time they can outfly them, um, but those larger birds don't generally want to con constantly keep getting pecked in the head or attacked. And so they don't want to spend a whole lot of time if they're getting mobbed. And so it's a great way to be anti-predatory. Um, uh, as a behavior. And then of course, warning sounds. If you ever hear that loud shrill of a blue jay, they're telling um, other animals there's a predator around here. Great, great way to try and see if you can find a, a bird of prey is by listening to crows and blue jays. All right, so winter survival. We talked about this a little bit. Um, we have the diet adjustment with the with the robins, and then of course migration. This is just a fascinating uh, adaptation to be able to survive the winter, um, being able to move from one place to the next. You know, ruby throated hummingbirds are a great example. This big uh, movement from across the Yucatan all the way um, into the, across the Gulf of Mexico into southern Texas, Louisiana areas, nonstop flights considered to be far safer than going across the land, even though it's longer. Uh, because it's shorter, um, even though it's nonstop, uh, avoids predators and, and um, for, the, for a number of the birds that do that type of flight, you know, they're on the wing quite a bit during their life. So migration is super fascinating and it's a method of survival. Uh, so I wanted to quickly just go over some raptor identification. We're touching on a lot of stuff, a lot of different stuff, we're doing it relatively quickly um, because these are all birds that you can see. So uh, right here is uh, an American kestrel. Uh, we have a female to the left. This is uh, this is Skylar. This is one of the birds I train at Willowbrook Wildlife Center. Um, and this is a male. Um, uh, American kestrel. And again, you can see that different coloration between the male and female. What's cool about kestrels is they're one of the, the few that have such different coloration um, between male and female as uh, birds of prey. So males have more slate color. Um, they have more slate on their wings. They have spots and orange on their chest. The females have more streaking on them, more dull blue colors on them. Here we have two other predators that you can see in this area. Uh, a great horned owl to the left. This is one of ours, Andre, um, with us because you know lost eyesight in, in the right eye. Over here we have a barred owl, not barn, barred. Um, they're the ones that do the who cooks for you, who cooks for you all. You know that kind of sound. <laughs> it may not have sounded as great over the over the uh, digital media, but uh, so the barred owl again. They they do tend to. They don't tend to share habitat too much with great horned owls. They'll be a little bit more in the wooded areas. These are the guys you're gonna find more likely in your backyards and in your neighborhood. Uh, they're just more apex predators um, to avoid that. You know, they don't wanna necessarily spend as much time in that area. These guys are gonna be more cavity nesters. These guys are gonna be um, stealing nests if they can um, from other types of large birds like red-tailed hawks, for example. But both species can be seen in this area. 
And then we have our most uh, popular and uh, populated uh, bird of prey, which is going to be the red-tailed hawk. And so you can see here, adult red-tailed hawk has that bright red color on the tail, but uh, red-tailed hawks that are juvenile do not. Uh, but you can still identify them by what we call our be the belly band. So this belly band goes across their belly. Um, it just splotches and stripes um, that is almost connects to them. And it's a good way to be able to identify whether or not it's a, a red-tailed hawk or not, or if it's a different type of what we call budio, which is a type of um, larger uh, hawk, broad-winged hawk kind of thing. Broad-winged hawk is a type of species, um, but I'm talking about a, a description in, in this point as opposed to this one, which is an occipiter, uh, which is, they're gonna be a little bit more woodland. They have shorter wings and longer tails compared to um, red-tailed hawks. Cooper's hawks, the one that you're gonna find at your bird feeder sometimes. Um, they do get a bad reputation uh, because they are, the, they are bird eating birds. That's what they focus on. So we say, if you're gonna put up a bird feeder, be ready to feed all the birds, um, not just the ones you wanna feed. Uh, so in the case of a, a Cooper's hawk, this is the same species, but I just wanted to show you the difference between juvenile and adult. Uh, so uh, Cooper socks, uh, you know, they, they look a lot different when they, when they are adults compared to when they're young. They also look very similar to this species, which is the sharp-shinned hawk. They're smaller. They're going to be closer to blue jay size, a little bit bigger. Um, but again, they have different similar markings. Hard to tell size when you're looking in the field. Um, again, juvenile as opposed to adult. But I did put this little slide up here just to show you what is the big difference between these two. Um, again, it's easier to tell when they're adults, but the big difference is, is the Cooper's hawk is going to have more of a cap, whereas the sharp shin is going to have more of a hood. Again, size is going to be different. Um, Cooper's um, have more of a rounded tail with a white tip as opposed to sharp shins having uh, more of a, a squared off tail. Those are gonna be the big differences besides the size. Uh, I oftentimes are trying to look at the, the head if I can. There's other behavioral things that you can kind of tell like the flight patterns. Um, more, more often than not, you're gonna likely see a Cooper stalk than you're gonna be seeing a sharp shin, but you can still see one. They're just not quite as common. All right, so I do want to talk a little bit about um, those who do not learn from history are doomed to repeat it. I just wanted to put this out there because I talked about all these beautiful animals, but it is important for us to recognize that we have a role in how successful these animals are going to be able to be um, in this you know, in this, in this world that we share with them. And so um, these are two cases here. This is a passenger pigeon, and this is the ivory-billed um, woodpecker. Both, this is a pileated woodpecker. But the ivory-billed woodpecker and the passenger pigeon are both um, extinct species. Um, and, it's a, and it's believed to be done because of the, you know, the hands of humans. Um, passenger pigeons are overhunted, ultimately. We're talking about commercial hunting, uh, which wiped out their population. This is one of the birds that, uh, if you're unfamiliar with the passenger pigeon, I would love to talk about that at some point. It's just it's its own presentation in of itself, um, how interesting it was. But they flew in the billions. They're just in one of the largest, they believe to have been the largest mass of birds ever. Um, and we wiped them out. And the last one died in 1914, unfortunately, in the Cincinnati Zoo. The ivory-billed woodpecker was last spotted. Um, there's video of them from the 30s. I think they were last spotted in the 70s, uh, I believe. I have to double check that. But basically, this one, this um, poor animal uh, was lost due to habitat loss. Um, and that's a big factor. And so I just, this type of stuff is important to take into consideration because it's not really been that long ago where some of these animals have gone extinct. And as we know, it still is happening with some animals as of now. but. Um, Hopefully, uh, we can try and prevent that from occurring. And in some cases, we have. Um, in this particular case, I have a peregrine falcon on my left and a bald eagle on my right. Um, these are great success for stories. This is what I was talking about with Rachel Carson. Both of these animals were in, impacted by the DDT um, pesticide that happened. It was banned after Rachel Carson had written her book about Silent Springs, more or less, and the Endangered Species Act was, it was implemented. Um, those, kind, those combinations of the banning of DDT to be used in the United States um, and the Endangered Species Act um, allowed for these populations, long story, very, very short, um, allowed for these populations to increase. Um, the peregrine falcon was off the federal endangered species list in 99, um, the bald eagle in 2007. 
peregrine falcon came off of the Illinois endangered species list in 2014. Um, and it's because of our ability to learn from the past and to make some changes. And because of those changes, we were able to allow for these large predators to come back into our labs and breed in this area. And so it's, it's a very, um, uh, it's a very happy, successful story um, for us to be able to share. And so right now in Chicago, um, you may be able to find uh, peregrine falcons hunting and flying around and nesting because they cl they're cliff nesters. And what best artificial cliffs that we have out there are skyscrapers. Um, bald eagles, they nest in this area as well. And there are times where people would think it was, they would drive for hours um, to be able to see this animal and we're able to see them in our local forest preserves right now. So again, great success stories and it's because we took the time to change our behaviors um, and by doing that we were able to allow for the species to, to to survive and not be a story of the past like the passenger pigeon um i wish i had a little bit more time there's a, a short video that, that i have here about the chicago bird collision monitors it's a volunteer organization that we work with um, you can check it out on YouTube if you want to. Um, it's called Bird Collision Monitors Need Volunteers. It's a little video I made a while ago, um, but basically we rely on our community to help us with these animals. Uh, birds flying into buildings is the second cause, is the number two cause to bird deaths in the United States. The first cause is cats, sadly. Um, you know, cats that are outside, um, feral cats, uh, they, they kill them in the billions. Uh, this is colliding into windows is thought to be in you know hundreds of millions um, every year and so there are some things that we can do to help prevent that and some things that we can do to help um, reduce some of the fatalities of that and so we actually have volunteers that during migration season will walk around the loop in downtown Chicago looking for birds that have been stunned or injured from flying into windows and oftentimes they can bring them back to us um, and they just need some time to recover where they're not um, ran over by vehicles or um, you know, attacked by predators or stepped on, unfortunately. Um, and so uh, sometimes they may need a little bit more care than that, but this volunteer organization has um, done a lot of help for thousands of birds within our local area. And so you can be a part of that too, if that's something that you're interested in. Of course, Willowbrook always can have volunteers as well. Um, but Chicago Bird Collision Monitors is a great way to, um, to help your, your birds uh, of your, uh, in this region. So uh, I like to end it with a quote from Edward Abbey, <laughs> wilderness is not a luxury, but necessity of the human spirit. And I do believe that is very true. And that's something we don't want to take for granted. Um, that this, what we have, our backyards, our forest preserves, our parks, um, any green space that we have, um, it's so important uh, to the longevity of our species and of course to the many other that are out there. And so um, if we look at it more as a, as a need and, and not a want, hopefully we can start to make some adjustments on that, on our behavior. Um, so at this point, um, I'm, I am about out of time, but if there are some questions, I would love to take the time to answer um, any questions that you may have for me. Thanks so much, Shane. That was a great presentation with a lot of wonderful, wonderful information. Uh, and again, just a reminder to the participants, if you want to go ahead and open up your Q&A window, there's uh, space to do that. Uh, and then you can enter your questions there. And, and I will read those aloud. We have a couple that we'll get to in just a moment. Uh, you mentioned uh, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology a couple of times during your presentation. I did look up the link for that. And I will be including that in the links that are going out to all of our registrants. Uh, you've provided a, a lot of information there, a connection link for you, as well as information about uh, the DuPage Forest Preserve and Willowbrook. So I'll be sending out all of those links, as well as uh, this link to the Cornell Lab uh, in the follow-up email. So if you're watching the recording of this presentation, you can, act, you can ask for all of those links by emailing emailing me at ce at wheatonlibrary.org. That's ce for community engagement at wheatonlibrary.org. So let's get to some questions. Uh, someone asks, uh, do the chickadees and woodpeckers uh, that perhaps hide those seeds, do, do they really uh, remember where they hid them? Uh, well, 
Yes, for the most part, they are going to. But just like, you know, how squirrels are going to bury some of their acorns, there's definitely going to be some spots that they forget. Um, but yeah, they actually have a really great memory um, as from, from place to place. And sometimes if you spend the time to observe um, the chickadees, you can actually see where they're stashing some of these little things, um, some of them, if they are grabbing them out of your feeder. Um, as far as whether or not woodpeckers hide suet, um, from what I understand, suet's mostly a, it's a lard base. Um, so I don't know if they're grabbing um, the seeds that that might be um, you know uh, intertwined in the in the suet, um, but yeah, woodpeckers are another species that will um, they will stash um, some of them, but not to the extent that I know of that chickadees are going to be doing it. Um, woodpeckers during the winter season do rely on seed and, and nuts, but they're also getting those dormant insects that are underneath the bark um, as another one of their resources. And that's a great protein resource for them. So they have a, a few other resources that they're able to access that some of the other birds may not be able to. Great, thank you. Uh, and you mentioned about robins that they were actually year round. Uh, there's a myth, of course, that you know you see your first robin in this, and it's an indicator of the beginning of spring. Is that actually not true in this area? So not as not in this particular area, no. So there are my, they they are migratory birds, so they will they will move farther south, but not every individual will do that. One of the ways that they've been able to adapt is by adjusting their diet. Um, so to say that yeah, there's a, the, the first time you see a robin, you quite literally could see a robin in January or February. And if you believe that myth, you're gonna be sorely disappointed with the winters that we have around here. So um, I would, I rely, and granted everything's adjusting and ecology is a dynamic situation, you know, and climate change is, is, is putting a lot of different um, twists and turns on things. Um, but um, I tend personally, um, myth or no myth, to, to pay attention to those red winged blackbirds. They, they tend to give me a little bit more of a closer indicator of when our springs are coming around. Um, that being said, it's, they are here, you know, it still can be wintery, but if they come too soon, if they come too early, then they can have issues with finding a proper um, nesting and habitat and resources sometimes. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, someone is asking a question about Baltimore Orioles. Uh, they used to visit uh, the jelly feeders early in the summer every day, but um, this person hasn't been seeing them at their feeders recently. Would they have migrated south already? No, there are still um, Baltimore Orioles in this area. They're, they're young, are still um, growing so that they haven't uh, they're not ready to migrate just yet, um, but they are going to be earlier than the ones that we have around here, or I shouldn't say, um, than, than the birds that I had mentioned earlier in the presentation, like the goldfinches. So they'll, they'll tend to breed earlier in the season. Um, that being said, though, there has been a lot of talk in the birding world about just um, bird numbers in general, people aren't seeing quite as many. Uh, there's not as many getting to coming to their feeders. Um, and there, there's a lot to be said for um, there's just not as many birds in general. And I'm talking very um, broad at, at this point about that. Um, but there's a number of reasons as to why bird populations they believe overall have been decreasing. This year in particular, um, there has been a notice that there's been less bird activity um, that, that has been seen from a lot of other birders in the birding community, um, at least in the beginning of it. Uh, migration season was throwing a lot of curveballs to people this spring. There were a lot of birds that everyone was expecting to see, um, like uh, like warblers, for example, and they weren't seeing as many as they had, had, had thought they would, myself included. Uh, Baltimore Oreos, I saw quite a few earlier on in the season, uh, come spring and early summer, but they have started to um, back off a little bit as far as their activity is going. Um, a lot of birds will slow down come the heat of the day, in the heat of the summer. They're not going to be quite as active, and so you're not going to see as many birds this time of year as you would um, early spring and I shouldn't say early spring, but migration spring, May, in the, in the month of May and early summer, um, as you are going to see in these hotter um, August days. Okay, how about uh, purple martins? Have they already left the area? Uh, most of the migrants have not left this area yet. The migration that we're seeing right now is they're coming to us. So we're getting a lot of the boreal 
um, boreal forest creatures um, flying down toward us. So we're starting to get them to come this way. Um, I'd have to look more specifically on the Purple Martin history um, as to what time of year they start their migration. But generally speaking, they could have started about now um, to start moving farther south. Um, but I'd, I'd have to double check to see when their peak season is for their migration. I'm just not familiar off the top of my head when they're moving around. Sure, sure. And there's always a lot of interest in, in those hummingbirds. Uh, yeah. What, what about approximately is the time frame when they are in our area? So they'll start coming around in May um, and June. They should be here. Um, they'll start even a little bit in later April. So you can time hummingbirds a lot with the flowers. Um, they're going to want to start they don't want to come too soon because they rely heavily on that nectar. Uh, once those flowers start blooming, especially the tubular flowers, um, they're going to be more likely to be in this area. So that usually tends to be around May um, when you're going to start to see them. But this year, they had been seen in March uh, and a couple of times. So they had been here um, earlier than May. But when you're going to see most of them, you're going to see them. That being said, we usually advise people to keep their bird feeders out all the way up until December. Uh, because you may still get some late migrants going down, especially youngsters um, who are going to really rely on some of that nectar um, and some of that sugar water. Okay. And what are some of the best flowers to attract those hummingbirds? Um, well, there, you know, cardinal flower is a native one that's really is, an, is a good attractant. I, um, the, the trumpet vine is another, uh, another great flower for them to go to. Um, again, you're going to get ones that are going to be, a lot of people think that red is the only color that they go to. It's not necessarily the case, um, but you will find that red ones do attract them. So if you go with red native plants, um, and again, that, that tubular shape is also nice for them because it eliminates some competition for some of the, the nectar from other species that can't quite get, their, get themselves in there. And so that longer beak, longer tongue can allow them to access that as opposed to having it being shared with you know, different bees and um, uh, different butterflies and stuff. So. And I think this is a great question to, to end with tonight, you know, as we're trying to keep our birds safer and take better care of them. I think you mentioned uh, really cleaning out the bird feeders. Uh, someone else is asking about helping to prevent birds from crashing into the windows. Uh, yeah, so how... Um... How can you prevent them from crashing? There's a number of different ways, but ultimately the, the, the big thing that's recommended um, for, how, for homeowners is to create some kind of um, visual barrier. They don't really understand uh, you know, the, the concept of glass. They don't know what, what, what's inside, what's outside. So it's, a, it's an invisible wall that they're ultimately flying into. And so what we always encourage people to do is, it depends on your comfort level. You can, um, you can, during migration season in particular, you can keep your blinds or have blinds that are, um, that are going down your window so that it at least looks like a visual barrier. I'm not saying you have to have your blinds closed or anything like that, but something that's going to be blocking wide open space. Um, some people, there's even, you can even draw lines down the window. Some people do, there's different uh, ways of doing that. Um, you can get those decals and you can put them on there. But the thing about the decals is, is you gotta put them close enough so that it doesn't look like they can just fly right through it. So you have to actually put quite a few of them. One thing that you can do that can really help is um, pay attention to where your plants are in comparison to the window. Um, obviously, I know plants are going to need some sunlight and such, um, but if you put like a, a very inviting large tree um, that has branches right inside of the window, um, that's going to look very inviting to the animal. It's going to fly. It's going to try and fly right through there. Um, so anything that can kind of uh, allow it to be at least in question that it's not a wide open space. Um, some people just smudge up their windows. You have a dog that really likes to wipe its nose on there, let them do that once in a while, you know, to keep that area looking like there's something there. That's really what the key is. So a, a, as far as what we've asked, like commercial areas and, and places in like the city of Chicago, um, one thing that happens is um, turning off lights in, in the upper build, upper levels of buildings has really helped. Um, it, it prevents it from looking like they're um, flying through the trees, you know, as opposed to, so this way, 
if they see a light, they, they think that the, this is a pathway through um, something and it ends up just being unfortunately a, a glass you know, window. Uh, so they've, there's been lights off Chicago and other cities that have participated in this with after a certain time during a certain time of year, um, you know, above a certain level, they'll, they'll ask everyone to turn their lights off. Um, also asking people to not put plants and stuff in like um, courtyards and corridors that are again, inviting for birds to go flying through that area, so. All right, well, thank you so much, Nate, for all this great information. We really appreciate it. And thank you, of course, to Willowbrook Wildlife Center and the DuPage Forest Preserve. Nate has provided a lot of resources uh, some links, uh, contact information, and I, I mentioned that I also found the link to that Cornell Lab uh, Ornithology, uh, Cornell Lab of Ornithology link as well. So I'll be sending that out to everyone who's registered. CE at wheatonlibrary.org, that's CE for community engagement at wheatonlibrary.org, and I'd be happy to send those links out to you. So again, thank you so much, Nate, for putting this together for us. Uh, thanks to everyone for joining us, and we hope to see you soon. Everybody take care. Good night.